Hello everyone, welcome to the shop. In response to some uh, questions I got about the threading attachment for the Horth lathe, I thought I'd do this video kind of about threading on plane turning lathes in general, and figured I should start with showing something about a conventional lathe and how threading is achieved on a conventional lathe, what makes that different from threading on a plain turning lathe. So you can see here my rivet, and it's probably the least conventional conventional lathe you could conceive of. But for the purposes of what we're talking about here, it, it'll suffice. What we're concerned with is the lead screw across the front of the machine here. So when we talk about single point threading on a lathe, this lead screw is what lets us achieve that. I'm not going to get into a lot of details specifically about how threading on a conventional lathe works, you know, either what's going on mechanically in great detail or, you know, how the work itself is performed. That's not really what we're concerned with here, but just some light background for maybe the uninitiated I'm not sure why the uninitiated would be watching this. So in effect we have this lead screw that can be configured to turn in synchronization with the headstock here. So as the headstock rotates you can arrange the change gears or if you have a quick change gearbox select the correct ratio to make this lead screw turn at a particular rate relative to the headstock. That of course is what allows you to cut threads in your work by engaging the saddle here with the lead screw. There's some controls on the apron on a conventional lathe that engage it with the lead screw. Now a lot of people see a plain turning lathe and immediately think second operation lathe second op machine and while it can be great for that they kind of have their roots in precision uh, instrumentation work clock making watch making and their apparent lack of certain features really turns a lot of people off of them and i think a lot of people don't necessarily realize what you can do with them given certain attachments that you know admittedly can be uh, difficult to find. So you would look at a plain turning lathe and think you can't thread. Let's take you over to one of the Horth machines and it'll be easier to show visually. Here we are at one of the plain turning machines. This is the screw cutting Horth. As you see it here it's set up for threading already I thought it would make sense to start this way, to kind of point out what's happening here when you have a threading, thread cutting setup on one of these machines. Similar to a conventional lathe, we have a gear train on the headstock end that's driven by the cone pulley ultimately here. There's a power output on the back of the headstock through this little pinion gear here. And that drives the gear stack that's arranged on this banjo fitting here. The gears used here will depend on the pitch of the threads being cut, but it drives ultimately this gear here on the end of this uh, drive shaft. This drive shaft is similar to what you might see on a car or a truck where it's got a universal joint on each end here to you know, make up for any angular differences that there will be here. And the other end of the drive shaft is simply coupled to the end of the lead screw that's uh, going through the, um, the compound slide up here. So in effect, your compound lead screw is acting like the lead screw on a conventional lathe. One of the obvious limitations here is that 
you have only the travel of your compound slide for thread cutting. For the type of work typically done on these um, plane turning instrument lathes, that's not a, not a problem. Another limitation is that for a typical threading operation, you'd need to be pretty careful to get this compound dialed in you know, exactly to, uh, to zero degree angle. Otherwise, you'll end up cutting a slight taper to your threads. And that can actually be uh, maybe an advantage in some unusual cases, too. If you wanted to cut threads on a taper for some reason, you know, this setup would let you do that pretty easily. One other disadvantage um, in, in any of these that I've seen, and I haven't seen that many of them, um, certainly with this one, um, there's no... Uh, there's no quick, easy way to uh, to de decouple this mechanism to declutch it. You know, whereas on most conventional lathes, you can uh, quickly kick out the um, engagement with the lead screw. You know, here here you really can't. It's a pretty hard mechanical arrangement. Once the machine is stopped. You can swing part of the gear train out of the way. That'll work. You can't do that while the lathe is running, obviously. This particular machine has a tumble reverse mechanism uh, inside the uh, cone pulley here. Um, and that allows a uh, neutral setting so that this output gear here won't receive power from the headstock anymore. Uh, that's another way it can be, uh, you know, declutched, so to speak. Except you still can't really do that while it's running. You risk stripping the gears. So you do need to be a little more careful threading with a setup like this than on a conventional lathe. And another drawback there will be to many uh, plane turning lathes with these threading attachments uh, is lack of uh, back gearing. And that's no drawback of the thread um, the thread cutting attachment itself. It's simply that most plane turning lathes that I've seen uh, don't don't have a back geared headstock. This one happens to, uh, which is fantastic. Um, so I know on a lot of them I think you'd end up either turning the spindle by hand, especially for very small work, uh, or just threading maybe a, a little bit quicker than a lot of people would be comfortable with. So before we get into the real details of this particular threading attachment and, and into some considerations for even making a threading attachment similar to this for a similar type of plane turning lathe, um, let's go a little bit uh, further into this particular threading operation. So in this case here, I have this set up to cut 40 threads per inch. And in this particular case, since this is a factory attachment, and since I happen to have the uh, factory catalog here, I have a handy chart showing the different gear arrangements that you would need to cut different thread pitches. And this aspect is much like a, you know, a change gear lathe of a more conventional type that determines the stack of gears that you arrange at the end here. And as the headstock's turned, as you'd expect, that arrangement's turned. And you can see this drive shaft is driving the end of the compound uh, screw up here. This maybe isn't the best vantage point in the world, but let's try taking a threading pass here. We have the back gears engaged. And we're set up for a 40 threads per inch. The threading tool isn't set up properly at all. Um, it's just enough to show you the general idea.
And you can see what I mean there about it getting away from you. You want to be a little more careful than I did there about stopping the machine well before, you know, where you want to stop your threads. I started to cut into the shoulder a little bit there as the momentum of the machine kept it turning there. If we get out our threading gauge. You should see 40 threads per inch exactly. So there's in a nutshell what uh, threading on a plane turning lathe is like and that it can be done. So let's get into some details about the construction of the threading attachments themselves. These attachments are you know, difficult enough to obtain that a lot of people seem to consider making their own. I know I certainly have in the past and I've talked to others you know, who have as well. And you know, it can be daunting from a, you know, from certain aspects. Some people are put off by the notion of, um, you know, cutting a stack of gears. Some people don't quite know how they would make the universal joints. Some people just have a hard time, you know, calculating the, the different gear ratios they need to cut different threads on their particular machine. You know, the camera's a little further away right now. I hope you can still hear me okay. So to start with, we have this coupling up here. And there are a few pretty fundamental considerations you'll want to make when designing one of these for your lathe. And one of them is the rear of your um, compound lead screw up here and whether it even has a uh, you know, readily accessible takeoff point like this. You might have something similar to this compound where the rear just has a retaining nut of some kind and there's no good way to, to you know, attach a coupling to it. Um, you might even have an arrangement similar to my watchmaker's lathe where the end of the screw was sunk down into the, the slide a ways and there's nothing at all on the end of it. So your worst case scenario there is having to remake a screw for your compound um, you know that gives you some means to attach a coupling to it. I think in a lot of cases with a little bit of ingenuity you could figure out how to work with the existing screw without needing to remake it, but it might not be as elegant as you want. So you can see the drive shaft has a telescoping mechanism. Now obviously that lets you um, position your uh, slide rest at different points along the bed. Can't get real far away. You know, this one, you know, we could get about an inch or so further away from the headstock than in the test cut we just made. The telescoping arrangements fairly forward in this. There's just a good snug sliding fit and a single keyway cut along the piston here. And that engages presumably with a pin that's up in this end of the of the uh, drive shaft housing here, whatever you'd call this piece. So the universal joints on either end here are pretty nicely made but there's really not a lot to them. I always thought making a couple of smaller universal joints sounded like a pretty fun machining project. Um, 
but I'm sure if you look around you can find a source for some small universal joints depending on how small you need. I know that model uh, RC cars and trucks have very small ones that may be suitable for you know, watchmakers lathe uh, size attachments. I don't imagine you'd find any that are well made that are very cheap, but I could be wrong. If you're designing and building your own attachment and it's completely up to you what the specs of the gears will end up being. But this sector or banjo or whatever you want to call it and the arrangement for holding the, um, the gears in place on here is probably going to be somewhat more standard. Here's our 120 and 60 compound gear. I mean, these are pretty modular. Any of the gears in the set that came with this are drilled for these pins. You can just swap the pins around and make all kinds of crazy compound uh, gear ratios. But this T-bolt and bushing and nut. It's a pretty standard arrangement for holding change gears in place. And there should be a screw on the end of this drive shaft gear to keep it retained. It's a pretty snug fit. And I actually have to remake the screw. Go. Let's remove this whole assembly for a moment. Let's get this collar closer out of the way. And maybe you can see a little better here. Let's move you around to the end. Welcome to the outboard end of the headstock. Here you can see the stud gear that drives the threading attachment when it's in place. This is in turn driven by a tumble reverse mechanism that you can sort of see here inside the cone pulley. And that tumble reverse mechanism is driven by a uh, gear that's mounted to the spindle in here. So inside here you have the spindle gear and these two tumble reverse gears, these three tumble reverse gears mesh in and out depending on the position of this lever here. And that's something you're not apt to see on you know, most plane turning lathes that have a thread cutting attachment. Certainly a real nice feature. It'll let you cut left-handed threads. It lets you reverse the rotation of this gear train relative to the spindle. So another basic consideration if you're thinking about building one of these threading attachments yourselves is how you're going to get power from the spindle down to your threading attachment to that is to say to the stack of gears that are part of your threading attachment. 
one of the easiest ways and what seems to be the most common is simply to mount a gear on the uh, outboard end of the spindle here and have that mesh with the gear train on the end so pretty similar to this gear that's inboard here now one thing interesting about the Horths is all of the headstock castings regardless of you know whether they're back geared or whether they came with a thread cutting attachment from the factory they all have the the hole here for the um, power output to come through. Now in contrast let's take a look at the little watchmaker's lathe here and this came from the factory with no provisions whatsoever for uh, thread cutting or mounting a thread cutting attachment and there's not a lot of room in the headstock design for a, a slick arrangement like the Horth has with tumble reverse and an output stud coming out of the, uh, the headstock. So for this case here, if I was going to make a threading attachment for this little machine, I would mount a drive gear to the end of the spindle here, and I would use the end of the D-bed right here to mount the, uh, the sector, the banjo, whatever you want to call it, the carriers for the, uh, for the change gears. Now really this isn't the most versatile arrangement in the world. If you were making your own, I, I don't think this is quite the design you'd probably want. But in the case of this particular machine, it works just fine. There are some simpler designs I think that are easier to make and probably a little more versatile. And if you're thinking at all about uh, making your own thread cutting attachment for a plane turning lathe, I would recommend a book called Practical Benchwork for Horologists. Uh, there's a section of the book that gives very detailed um, plans and uh, write-up for making a screw cutting attachment for one of the uh, Webster Whitcomb type watchmaker's lathes. It's an excellent starting point it gives you a handy table of the gears that you'll need to cut various thread pitches in metric and imperial depending on what your screw pitch is um, and it gives you some uh, very nice drawings for all of the parts involved that you can scale up or down as necessary to suit your your application so if you're looking for any sort of head start on making your own from scratch and you don't have an existing um, you know an existing attachment for your specific lathe to work from I think that's about as good as it gets so this is the book I was just referring to I got this copy on Amazon for less than ten dollars I don't remember the exact amount it's been out of print a long time um, but it seems you can still find copies if you keep your eyes peeled. Practical Benchwork for Hor Horologists by Louis Levin and Samuel Levin. There's quite a long first section in the book about various tools used. So this starts on page 62 in my edition. So I was talking about thread cutting and it starts with the tables of gears for metric and then the inch. And you can see here a photo of a leaven lathe outfitted with a you know, fairly elaborate looking screw cutting attachment. And they get right into a section on making a screw cutting attachment. And this is filled with really great write up and some good drawings of all the parts you'll need to make. I think in this they assume you're going to purchase the gears. You know, that may or may not be feasible for you in your situation. I know the last time I looked at doing this for my watchmaker's lathe. Um, 
I won't say that I couldn't purchase the gears anywhere but they certainly were way out of budget and I mean I know these screw cutting attachments don't come up for sale very often but for what I'd have to spend on gears you know I could have just bought one of the attachments for seven eight hundred bucks when it did come up for sale so you remember that screw that was missing from my threading attachment I thought this would be a pretty good opportunity to go ahead and make a replacement for it using this very threading attachment to have the lathe make one of its own parts. The screw has a 5 8 inch diameter head and quarter 28 threads. Thanks for watching everyone, and remember, don't do anything I wouldn't do.